Koite Arapuru Sounds Inga reo, inga mana, rauranga te rama, tēnā koutou katoa. You're with the podcast series Sounds Podcasts, and this is Te Ropu El Sistema, Strings for All, produced by Popsock Media for Sounds Centre for New Zealand Music, Toi Te Arapuru. Ko Kirsten Johnstone, aho. I like how everything has a different part, but it all sounds nice together. I kind of get goosebumps whenever like, we get something right. It, um, there's like this kind of magic feeling. I love performing. <laughs> you learn a lot of life lessons from it as well. Well, all the teachers are really nice and we get to like go to concerts and have fun and meet new people. These kids are from a group called Aroha Nui Strings. They're an organisation that provides free tuition and orchestral stringed instruments in the Hutt Valley and central Wellington. On the day I visit, they're at the Michael Fowler Centre, preparing for a concert alongside Orchestra Wellington. There's little six-year-old kids who've only been playing for months or even weeks. Right up to rangatahi who've been learning for a decade. I've been in orchestras. I've worked as a music journalist for more than a decade and... While there are a lot of things to notice about this particular orchestra, there's one that really jumps out. This is one of the most diverse orchestras I've ever seen. There's people of all ages, but also all sorts of backgrounds and ethnicities. The musicians are Filipino, Korean, Samoan, Maori, Burmese, Somalian, Vietnamese, Sri Lankan, as well as Pakia. Part of our ethos is radical inclusion. This is Hayden Nickel. Aroha Nui Strings Musical Director. And it just means that we welcome as many people as we possibly can. This radical inclusion means teaching kids from all different cultural backgrounds, some with multiple languages and some with different learning abilities. Often these kids come from families who couldn't afford music lessons or instrument hire, and Aroha Nui Strings are able to provide these for free. Yeah, if I could jump in, I think the key thing that these programs offer is breaking down these obstacles into just entering something like classical music because those obstacles are pretty massive. These obstacles, music fees, the expense of instrument hire or purchase, the time and money involved with getting kids to and from lessons, are a big reason that most orchestras in the Western world are still overwhelmingly white. Sure, most classical music fans in New Zealand would be able to name a few exceptions. Notably, the NZSO concertmaster for a decade from 1993 was Fijian-born, Auckland-bred Wilma Smith. But on the whole, multiculturalism hasn't reached the professional orchestra pits of the Western world yet. People of colour the world over have reported racism and discrimination within classical music, and it still seems like the domain of the white and privileged. But looking at these kids on stage, I'm hopeful that can change. Nice. Wow. That sounds really good. And then basically... There's a lot of cooperation and collaboration has to go on. This is Jane Young, a cellist and one of the Aroha Nui Strings teachers. So learning how to um, communicate with their peers and how to, as a group, collectively pull together to, to do something together, to do a performance together, to do a rehearsal together. And so it's, it's always this idea of teamwork pulling together and your, your background, your you know, social standing, your ethnicity, none of it matters. It all falls away. Sometimes I think our program attracts students that don't necessarily fit in in other places. They feel safe and included and it becomes their new family. This piece you're hearing, by the way, is by Glenn Downey, a New Zealand composer who wrote this especially for Aroha Nui to play with Orchestra Wellington. It's commissioned by Sounds. Aroha Nui Strings is part of a network, Te Ropu El Sistema. There's two other Sistema programs in Aotearoa, one based in Otara, South Auckland, and the other in Whangare. In this podcast, we're going to meet some of the players and teachers, have a look at the way they work, and delve into some of the questions people have about Sistema.
You might have heard of El Sistema. It's fairly famous, in orchestral circles at least. Conductor Sir Simon Rattle said in 2007... There's no more important work being done in music now than is being done in Venezuela. El Sistema started life in an underground car park in Caracas, Venezuela in 1975, with 11 enthusiastic kids being taught by musician, economist and politician José Antonio Abru. He believed that music education was a right for all children and that Venezuela should have a national orchestra to rival those in Argentina and Mexico. The Venezuelan government agreed, and despite changing political ideologies over the years, El Sistema has been well-funded, and the programme grew from those initial 11 students to 700,000, with dozens of orchestras and choirs around Venezuela. And in a country where 75% of people currently live in extreme poverty and the drug cartels hold immense power, El Sistema came to be seen as a way out. Their motto for years was tocar y luchar, to play and to fight. Y hoy podemos decir Today we can say that art in Latin America is no longer a monopoly of elites and that it has become a social right for all the people. To sing and play together means to intimately coexist. Those are the words of José Antonio Abru from when he was awarded a TED Prize in 2009. In 2007, the Simón Bolívar Youth Orchestra, El Sistema's premier group, played the BBC Proms. The young players were led by Sistema's brightest star, Gustavo Duromel, all wild hair and manic energy. The orchestra stunned classical fans with an electrifying performance, which included an incredibly intense Shostakovich 10, the Latin rhythms of Mexican composers Moncayo and Marquez, and by the encore, a number from Bernstein's West Side Story, they were wearing Venezuelan flag-coloured jackets and chair dancing, with Latin American flair to music from Argentina and Costa Rica. It's infectious. And I've never seen an orchestra or their audience having so much fun. Go look it up on YouTube and you'll see why, after that performance, El Sistema was picked up in 60 countries, in all continents, except Antarctica, inspiring over 400 individual programs. It's been portrayed as a heartwarming story of triumph over adversity. But El Sistema Venezuela has also been the subject of intense academic analysis and controversy. And we'll get to that. But first, let's get to know the Sistema Ropu here in Aotearoa. Hi, I'm Viliami. I play the violin in uh, Tongan and I'm 16 years old. Salah for lover, my name is Inya Tomaival, I play the violin. I'm 19 years of age, currently at university. What do you study? So I study a Bachelor of Music, Opera Singing, and I study a Bachelor of Arts, Criminology, and then Politics. Inya and Viliami are part of Sistema Aotearoa. The group was set up in 2011 in Otara, and Inya has been with them since the very beginning, since she was about eight Coming from South Auckland, we have a lot of stigma around our like behaviour and what we are capable of doing. So when the programme started, it was cool to see that they wanted to be based in South Auckland. Majority of um, the free programmes would usually start around Central Auckland or maybe West Auckland. But it was cool to see that more opportunities were coming to South Auckland. And it's great now because we have students from all year groups ranging from year two to first year uni. We have over 500 students, I think. Yeah, and we both have siblings in the programme, so we have, like, mini orchestras at home. (laughs) She's not exaggerating. Her brother plays the double bass, and two younger siblings play violin and cello, while mum and dad play piano and everyone sings. Her mum, Lena, is on the board of trustees for Sistema Aotearoa. And while the family is musical, learning orchestral instruments hadn't crossed their mind until Sistema came along. So being able to have the space where Polynesian kids in South Auckland can go and parents don't have to worry about fees or them not being safe because it's in our area. I think it's just a peace of mind and I know a lot of children wouldn't have even known what a violin was if it wasn't for Sistema. I personally didn't know what a violin was um, before my first lesson. 
Do you think that your families would have been able to afford music lessons or been inclined to put you in, you know, classical music lessons if this wasn't available? Yeah, definitely not. Def- yeah, to answer your question. I mean, like, also with the time, you know, dropping us off. Because now that we're older, we usually just catch a train or a bus, just come to Sistema. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's pretty hard to get private lessons, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, just the money involved of it just keeps on piling up. So, yeah, it's pretty grateful for Sistema Aote mm. I suspect these two would always have succeeded at whatever they put their minds to. But that specialist orchestral training has definitely given them experiences they might not have had otherwise, like meeting Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, or singing for the Governor-General in Government House Gardens. And we get to play alongside the APO, like, every single year. And even when we were, like, year four, and we would go do um, little gigs for little private events, even just getting out of South Auckland was like a dream for a lot of these kids, you know. Going to the city was a dream for these kids, and these kids get to go with their friends and play their music. Sistema also gave Enya a leg up to get into the kind of school that charges $26,000 a year. So I went to St. Cuthbert's College, which is um, a pretty prestigious school in New Zealand, (laughs) in fact. Um, I wouldn't have made it there if I didn't have the scholarships that I got. And I don't think I would have been eligible for that if I didn't have the knowledge that I had received from Sistema. So I personally would say that Sistema has changed my life. I was slightly sceptical when when I first started in Harmony Liverpool. This is Rod Skip. He's a cellist and has been the programme director with Sistema Aotearoa since returning from England in 2019. But he spent 10 years as musical director of a very similar organisation in Liverpool called In Harmony. Like, are these kids going to really want to learn to play violin and cello and stuff? But actually, there's something universal about uh, playing an instrument learning an instrument and children all over the world I've seen really love that and it's, it's the same here in Otara as well. One of the great things about um, orchestral music making is you all come together to agree so you're all coming together and, and no one has to win or lose but you can all collectively win you can always play the best version of that song or that uh, piece of music so that's a really um, supportive kind of atmosphere for young people to kind of thrive. They don't have to be the best violinist in the world to have a really great time uh, learning music together with their friends. <laughs> There's been quite a bit of media over the years about these groups. Feel good stuff. Here are some cute kids from poor areas learning a skill that wouldn't previously have been available to them. And it is a feel good story, right? The uncomfortable bit about it is... Isn't it all a bit, well, colonial? I mean, we're talking about mainly, not all, Pākehā people teaching Western art music, music by white people, to mainly Moana Pacific, Māori, immigrant and refugee kids in the hope that the beauty and discipline of classical music can improve their social outcomes. So this question, and other questions like it, has been posed by a lot of academics around the world. And I want to come back to those Venezuelan kids at Royal Albert Hall, proms 2007, because when I said that Sistema has been the subject of intense academic scrutiny, it's that initial model that's had the most analysis, and for good reason. One academic, Jeffrey Baker, has studied El Sistema Venezuela extensively and published a scathing book about it in 2014. Baker had many criticisms and accusations, among them that El Sistema put musical proficiency above the children's well-being, that Abru was a tyrannical leader with a Eurocentric approach, that players in the Simon Bolivar Orchestra had not come from the most deprived families at all, and that there was a culture of sexual abuse. At the time, the accusations were dismissed by El Sistema as absolutely false. These claims have since been substantiated by others. Those young people playing the proms so brilliantly? Former members of the orchestra talk about the gruelling rehearsal schedules, the bullying and gender discrimination. 
Now, El Sistema Venezuela is a very different thing to what we have in Aotearoa, and there are no reports of anything like that happening on our shores. But the ethical questions of which art forms are considered more valid and whether people of colour are being encouraged into the world of classical music or bludgeoned with yet another colonial construct are all important and need to be discussed. They all have the Sistema ideal of changing lives through music. So my very vague question was, OK, how do they do that? What does that mean? This is Lorena Gibson. She's a cultural anthropologist at Te Heringawaka Victoria University of Wellington, and a lot of her research has been on orchestral music education programs here in Aotearoa. And although she doesn't have a background in classical music, she became fascinated by the Sistema and Sistema-like programs. They reminded me of my own experiences growing up and belonging to pipe bands, Playing collectively. Her teen years were spent hanging out at free music programs for at risk youth at the Stomach in Palmerston North, and she knows firsthand about the potential for music to change people's lives. Academics tend to spend a lot of time with the subjects of their research before they even come up with the specific questions they want answered, and that's what Lorena did. She spent about eight months to a year hanging out with Aroha Nui and Porirua's virtuoso strings, watching, getting familiar with their processes, with the kids, their responses and repertoire. And she was helping out one day at a concert, doing some filming for one of the groups, and a person involved in music industry funding started chatting to Lorena about her research. The question that they put to me was, well, are these groups ethical? And I was a bit stumped by that. And I said, well, what do you mean? And the person said, well, it's essentially white women teaching brown kids how to play white music. What are the ethics of that? Just a note here. At the time, in 2019, the groups that Lorena was studying around Te Whanganui Atara were Arohanui Strings, the Virtuoso Strings Orchestra in Porirua, and wind instrument group Porirua Soundscapes. They were all founded and led by Pākehā women. And I didn't have an answer On the spot, I had to go away and think about what did that mean? What did they really want to know? What were they really asking? What were some of the assumptions behind that question? So I just thanked them. I said, that's a really interesting question. I don't think I had a good answer on the spot. Oh, first of all, I would say you won't know until you've been there. Because I I know just how hard our tutors try and make us feel comfortable. This is Enya Talamaivao, again, from Sistema Aotearoa in Otara, and you'll hear Viliami here as well. I think it's a stereotype that just because they're teaching us classical music doesn't mean they're bringing Western ideas, like, that's classical music. If anything, really, like, our tutors come in and they take part in our, like, cultural values and stuff and traditions, which is pretty cool to see, like, that they're willing to learn about our cultures, you know, even um, Sarah, Rod, yeah, they they incorporate Modi language into their daily like lives and stuff, and and it may not be our languages, but it's a step in the right direction in my opinion. And yeah, it's just happy to see like tutors that are actually willing to come and teach us, you know. And yeah, the, that the idea about like it's more Palangis and stuff. That's that's who I reckon that's a total lie because like we did have Jess Hinden, you know, a member of the Black Quartet, was it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we also have um Anne, she's Tongan. Justin's Asian. We have like Sarah. Sarah Scottish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's actually a lot of a cultures, range, yeah, yeah, within the tutors. So for us, it's not really like, like we see it as oh, the Balangis are coming in. It's more like there are a few Balangis who are willing to open mm. our doors and open opportunities for us. Mm. Some people think it's like a whole Angelina Jolie saving, you know, kids and, but. It's not, like, really like that. Like, they actually get to know our families. And, like, some of them have known us since we're year three, four. Mm. So, yeah, they, they've kind of become, like, older aunties and uncles. <laughs> Here's Lorena Gibson again. That question of are they ethical, I, want, I did wonder if the person was asking, are these, basically, are these white women who are running these groups are they white saviours are they trying to save young brown people from whatever Um, I don't see them as white saviours they definitely don't see themselves as white saviours they see excellence in these communities they see potential 
they see a gap in that there are no music programs being run there. They have expertise. They want to help. Their expertise happens to be in orchestral music. So for them, this is how they can do that. I think in practice, I saw really well-intentioned um, Pākehā and Tōiwi men and women, mostly women, trying to do their best and foster the musical excellence that they saw in these communities. Lorena fielded other pretty loaded questions about her research too. From a range of different people actually, whether it's culturally appropriate for these young people to even be in orchestras. Like, shouldn't they be playing, quote unquote, their music? I think there's a perception that certain people should be restricted to playing certain types of music, quite an essentialist, um, restrictive, narrow vision, which doesn't recognise that culture changes. It changes all the time, and it's influenced by all sorts of different things. I think people need to stop thinking that Polynesians can only do Polynesian music. Like, even though we're Polynesian, we can still do classical music. Like, that classical music's not a race. It doesn't belong to a certain race. It's, it's a universal language. We're used to seeing Asian string players in the spotlight, and the talent and prestige of Pacifica opera singers doesn't even warrant a comment. We don't see that many classically trained instrumentalists who grew up in a place like Ōtara on our stages. But things change. As we know, if you can see it, you can be it. And what these systemic kids are seeing is Pacific excellence in the field of classical music as more diversity in the teaching base is encouraged through these programmes. For me, growing up as a violinist, I was always the only brown person in the room. This is Anne Filimoyala, and she's been a tutor at Sistema Aotearoa for a year now, since finishing up her degree in performance violin. She grew up in Mount Roskill and didn't find out about Sistema until she was at university. When Rod Skip asked if she'd like to tutor on the programme, she jumped at the chance. Like, I never wanted to be a teacher, but here I am loving every hour that I get to work with the kids. I think they can relate to me on a different level because how, like, I'm Tongan and, you know, some of them speak to me in Tongan, which is cool. It sort of, like, puts a gleam in their eye, like, just seeing, like, brown people standing up in front of them and teaching them, it's inspiring for the little kids. I can relate to them. Those kids, they're just super talented and um, they just have a special gift Um, they can play by ear so well and that yeah they struggle a little bit at reading music but they get there in the end and they really love it and they have so much passion for music it's such a great environment to be in every day so yeah So Anne comes from a super musical family When my dad came to New Zealand it's all he had like because he learned how to play the cornet in Tonga and he did brass banding in Tonga and he just he just has a passion for it that I've never seen in anyone else he taught majority of the members in his family and passed it down to nephews and nieces and now he has his own brass band which is pretty cool and we get pretty cool gigs as well so it's cool that you get to be a part of an ensemble that's just your family members, so it's fun. <laughs> the brass tradition of Tonga needs its own podcast. But just briefly, the brass instruments came in with the missionaries of the 19th century and it's well and truly been adopted as a part of cultural life in the kingdom of Tonga, especially at Christmas. They do door-to-door caroling, and they stop at every house. Some Tongan bands do it here in New Zealand as well, which is cool. My dad's band does it as well. It is tiring on the lip, but it's fun just to give that joy to Tongan families here. The Fili Moihala family run their own free music programme for kids in central Tamaki, providing lessons in brass instruments, and Anne and her siblings all play and lead various bands, teach and compete. Anyway... So music was always going to be an unavoidable thing, being a Philly Moihara. But Anne's mum didn't want it to be all brass all the time. At home we had DVDs of Andre Rue and my mum used to always love watching those DVDs and her and her colleagues at work, they'd always tell her how much that they love the violin and how it's an instrument that you can take everywhere. Luckily they didn't tell her about the piccolo. 
So Anne took up the violin aged nine and fell in love with it. Playing the violin, I was, I was just on my own. And like, my dad would help me read music, but he couldn't help me with fingering and technique or anything like that. So yeah, it was just a completely different world, learning violin. She says it was pretty hard financially on the family and there were many sacrifices, especially for her eldest sibling, who helped support them. But music was life for the Philly Moihalas, and they made it work. All three sisters have music degrees now. I can tell even without seeing her in action that Anne's a great teacher. I like to establish what a student is good at, at first. And I think that's what I like about the Sistema program because that's what they do. They um, concentrate on the strengths of the kids. One of the proudest moments I've had as a teacher was with the holiday course for Year 2 students. And we spent a week with these kids and it was their first time touching the instruments. And by the end of the week, they presented a concert to their parents and just seeing how much they learnt and how good it sounded and how much fun they were having. It was it was such a great moment. And that's when I realised what kind of teacher I was because um, I got emotional <laughs> and it was like overwhelming in a good way. And for me as a student, I used to, I'd never understood why teachers would be like that. Like, I remember my teachers from uni would get emotional when I did well, and I used to cringe at it, but I'm like, I am that teacher, I'm exactly the same. (laughs) So, yeah. These children, playing music for them is also learning how to um, communicate with their peers and how to, as a group, collectively pull together With Sistema, it's not just about the teachers in charge. A big part of the philosophy is peer-to-peer learning. Here's Jane from Arohanui Strings. The idea is that if a child can play three notes and the person next to them can only play two, well, they'll show them how to play the third one. So there's always this flow of helping. And I really saw a lot of that going on in the holiday program. And on the first day, there was a little boy tiny little fella who was very shy and very quiet and didn't want to participate at all and then one of the older boys took him under his wing doing some of the activities with him and encouraging him and by the second day he'd gotten that little bit of confidence. This means there's a little less demand on the teachers but also that the kids coming through get to develop their leadership skills. And that's also interesting to see that side of them develop too. We've had advanced students come along sort of hired as helpers in the first holiday program when they've got this role they'll just sit there just kind of watching and not sure what to do and needing a lot of guidance and so the lead teacher will say you know why don't you show so and so how to hold their violin or why don't you write in a fingering for them or whatever and then the next year they come and help they just start being a bit more proactive and you know by the end occasionally we've had one or two have been happy to step up the front and actually lead a group so that's neat too. We've worked really hard to build up our our tutor team from within the students from the program. This is Rod Skip from Sistema Aotearoa. So we have a really great uh, team of rangatahi who are students within the program and they also tutor for us after school in a paid role. Both Enya and Viliami, who you met earlier, have become tutors, helping the little kids out. It's actually pretty cool, you know, it's it's, um, just being able to like help the younger generation on their musical journeys as well. Uh, we were assigned a few days and we come in after school and we help on the younger orchestras. This is a pretty big time commitment from the Sistema Rangatahi. Yeah, um, well, like, I guess with anything good, it, it does take a huge commitment. You know, you have to sacrifice the time, the effort to put in. But I, th- I think um, all of our Rangatahi are more than willing to do that, you know, because we just really want to see more kids from our area, you know, South Auckland, you know, we'll put not not that good of portrayal in the media, but, you know, just can show that we still can grow from our roots. And their own initiatives are blooming. There's an offshoot of Sistema Aotearoa that grew from an idea that Enya had. A programme that we do is called Moana Toa. It's still performing arts, it's not really orchestral. It's kind of incorporating just Polynesian dancing, there's Samoan Tonga and Cook Island singing, and then there's just a bit of theatre, little skits, and then spoken word. 
basically I designed the program so that more children will explore performing arts but within our cultures, Polynesian culture. Mm-hmm. It's great because I get all of my friends to help out with me. The program has no tutors, um, well, at least like none of the tutors that teach us in Sistema. It's solely just students that have gone through the program. There's one more critique of Sistema that Lorena heard people bringing up while she was doing her research. That they privilege Western art music above all other forms of music, that they use formal Western methods of teaching music, which don't always suit local populations, and that they can actually reinforce difference by just putting token songs into an otherwise Western classical repertoire. But Hayden Nichols says... Our programme has to evolve in a way that is relevant. Remember, Hayden is the musical director of Aroha Nui Strings. It's a pretty new position that he took on when founder Alison Aldridge returned to North America during the pandemic. And he and the other teachers are really just finding their feet since she left. Hayden's Samoan, by the way, and grew up learning violin in the Suzuki method. A big thing that I think we do well and that I have some ideas on how we can develop is how to make it culturally relevant. This conversation of, I guess, decolonizing classical music is the term that's going around at the moment. To me, that's not a very accurate term because it doesn't make sense to me to decolonize something that's inherently a Western art to begin with. Maybe it's more useful to talk about indigenizing classical music? Anyhow. What? we do really well at Aroha Nui is make it relevant to New Zealand culture in the way that a lot of our beginner music is um, taken from Māori waiata or Samoan pese. Um, So they're they're using these instruments that are traditionally a Western art instrument, um, but making it their own story kind of thing. And even the way that we practice is not the traditional method. So it's entirely just what is needed here in Wellington, in Stokes Valley. Fusion. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. fusion system. (laughs) Jane and Hayden say that when the students get to the advanced stage of their playing, their repertoire pretty much is Western classical because that's where the challenging music is. It's not that the kids are um, aching for that (laughs) in particular. (laughs) But um, But all the tunes that they recognise... Like, we've been working on Hall of the Mountain King, and they all already knew how that went, Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't realise the power of, for example, advertising. (laughs) (laughs) These sort of jingly things that they recognise, you know, bits of Nutcracker Suite and things. They're like, oh, I know that tune. And the kids will let teachers know if they're not into it. You know, in a very charming, childlike way, in the way they're like, I like the fast ones and not the slow ones. Yeah, and it's also an, an outlet for expression. I mean, it's a, maybe a bit cheesy to say it, but um, it's a way that they can show some things. Like sometimes we especially choose sad pieces. We don't always play happy, happy music because everyone needs a chance to put their back into something that's, you know, a bit angry or desperate or whatever, and they seem to rise to that don't they they, they don't yeah, turn up sure. their noses at, at, at um, pieces in minor keys I'm of the belief that any kind of practice in any sort of art offers kind of a, a perspective of life that is valuable in any capacity a lot of the families involved are time poor and the whole thing relies on other families who do have the time pitching in as much as they can. Here's Lorena Gibson from Te Heringawaka Victoria University. A lot of parents, they turn up, um, they don't just drop their kids off and go, it's not like a babysitting service. They turn up, they help set everything up, Um, they hang around, they talk to each other, they want to see what their kids are doing, Um, they make food in the kitchen, um, donated food, they would put on a supper for the the young people in between the two, the junior and senior orchestras. It relies a lot on community support. One of the things I noticed um, at Virtuoso Strings... Virtuoso Strings is the programme in Porirua that isn't affiliated with Sistema but essentially provides the same service. ...was how the some of the parents who were Samoan 
used the orchestra as an opportunity to practice for a Samoa, um, a Samoan kind of way of life. So when they would have food, for example, the parents would make sure the children sat down to eat and didn't run around with their food because you, when you eat in Samoan culture, you sit down and eat or you sit down and drink. You don't walk and run around with your food. Another parent I spoke with, a Samoan parent, said that she, she saw her involvement with the orchestra as an opportunity for her to practice tautua or service. Um, and she would show her children that this is a way that you can practice service to your community. These parents are parents who value education and if there's a free orchestral music program they're going to send their kids. If there's sport they're going to send their kids. If there's this happening in school they're going to send their kids. They value education and knowledge and they see the benefits that this kind of education can bring. Maybe not necessarily in terms of increased academic success but just in terms of opening up possibilities and ways of thinking about approaching learning is like a lifelong skill. By the way, people have studied the correlation between Sistema programs and academic success, and the results have been inconclusive. It's a hard thing to study. But it's kind of irrelevant. The fact is, these kids are having fun learning music, and they're boosting self-esteem and confidence. Lorena witnessed firsthand the pride and excitement these programs bring to both children and their parents. My own daughter joined both orchestras. <laughs> she um, was coming along with me to do my field work because she was young and it was just, you know, I had to take her. And she got bored sitting there. So she, one day she said, Mum, can I play? Can I play with them? So I went to Alison from Arohanui Strings and I said, Can actually, can she play? And Alison's response was, Of course, here's a violin. Come and sit here. And by the end of that first time, my daughter walked out glowing. She had gone in not knowing anything about the violin. She walked out with a violin, knowing how to sit and play with other people. Um, sounded pretty terrible what she was playing, but she was beaming. She made a friend. So straight away, you come in, you sit down, you're welcomed, you're given an instrument, you're shown that you can do it. That is really powerful, and as a parent, that was really powerful for me to see. Aroha Nui strings don't have a permanent hub right now, and Hayden really sees the value in something a bit like Sistema Aotearoa has in the OMAC complex in Ōtara and the Virtuoso Strings Hub in Porirua. Having something like that means that they can have their students turn up and just hang out, even if they don't have lessons, mm -hmm. which is something we can't do at the moment. But I think that's also super, super important um, to maintain those relationships away from the learning space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably what um, what really makes somewhere a safe place um, mm -hmm. when, yeah, you don't have any reason to be there, but you want to be there anyway. So that's it's, it's a big on our list for um, yep. what to do next. But whether they're in a permanent spot or moving around a bit, it's really important that they're super close to the people they want to connect with. These communities don't need any more barriers. Accessibility is one thing. And the other um, really important thing is, is frequency or, or intensity of classes. So if they're happening, if there's something on offer every day of the week, the child may or may not go every day of the week, but they've got that opportunity to go two, maybe three times a week. And then it doesn't matter if they can't practice at home because they're getting their practice in. Mm -hmm. And some of them, I know for sure, would not physically be able to practice at home because there's just no room mm -hmm. physically, people living in very crowded situations, and also just sound-wise. I mean, imagine trying to practice to see if your note's in tune when you've got all the siblings yelling and the dog barking and the, you know whatever happening at home so it's you're just you know creating that opportunity for them to be able to enjoy their music. One big difference between Sistema here and the alleged Sistema culture in Venezuela that saw kids exploited rather than uplifted is that musical excellence isn't the end game. I mean it's great to give kids a taste of mastery over an instrument but it's kind of a bonus. Well-being, stability, a sense of belonging, those all come before musical proficiency when you're in Sistema. 
teachers like Jane aren't just music teachers, they're caregivers too. Yeah, I think um, the first time that dawned on me really was actually quite a long time ago when Alison put me in touch with a um, Sistema program in Toronto and the director of that program, David Vissington, welcomed me warmly and I happened to be there at the time that they were doing a concert. And the concert was wonderful, very inspiring. And at the end of the concert, everyone was packing up and leaving and there was David, the manager of this massive organisation, walking around the hall with a broom but not only that, he had a, a small um, boy with learning disabilities hanging on to him as he did it. And he was just saying, we're sweeping together. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is absolutely the kind of epitome. <laughs> you run the whole show, you're teaching the kids music, you're organising everything, and then you do the cleaning up with a special needs child. And it's not just the organising and the cleaning up. Often it's driving the kids to and from rehearsals and, of course, feeding them while also taking the time to connect. We make sure that all the kids are being well looked after before anything. This is Anne Filimoihala again. Yeah, um, the kids who come straight after school before their orchestra sessions, um, they have this block called a snack time block. So they come in, they have snacks, and we all sit around the tutor, sit down with the kids, We talk with them, ask them questions like how is school and things like that. And we play little games. And I think that's their favourite part of the day, just eating and socialising with their tutors, which is, it's so cute. Um, Even the responses we get, they're hilarious. Um, The kids, they just have minds of their own. Of course, these programmes can't survive without funding and donations. The Otara Ropu are pretty well supported, but that support requires constant hustle. They apply annually for a contestable Creative New Zealand grant, which has been approved for next year. They apply for various other community grants and have private donors, and they're contracted by the Ministry of Education for an early years programme at ECE centres in Otara and by the Ministry of Youth Development. Aroha Nui Strings and Sistema Whangare, Toi Akorangi, are similarly funded by grants here and there. And of course, they're open to anyone who wants to donate. We've got, you know, elevator pictures we can pull out if you're suddenly face to face with somebody who looks like they might be able to spare a buck or two. And all three of the Sistema programs benefit from Todd Corporation sponsorship. But even then, the financial situation of these organisations can fluctuate from year to year. They're not short term projects. Rod Skip would like funders to see these programmes as long-term investments. Where we want to uh, develop the skills within a community over a long period of time, 25, 30, 50 years, you know. So we're, we're setting up for good, um, and that, that involves significant investment. Having some kind of core support that would last for several years, I, I know all arts organisations would love that, right? But um, that would be, um, yeah, absolutely transformative in terms of the way that we could plan, the way we could offer opportunities to our children and families. Through her research, Lorena Gibson heard a bit about the funding conundrum and the kind of questions these Sistema organisations have to answer. Some of the places you can go to for funding, they really like to feel like they're helping people living in poverty. So what that means is that you need to show, if you want to get this kind of funding, that the work that you're doing is going to do that. So how do you talk about poverty? How do you talk about maybe socioeconomic deprivation or exclusion? in a way that is going to get you funding and that also lets young people retain their dignity and that also reflects the actualities of the areas. Not everyone who goes to a decile one school is from a poor family. Um, Some of the parents I spoke with were actually a little bit annoyed at the way that the groups are sometimes represented, like um, some media reports can really quite sensationalise the fact, look, brown kids playing orchestral music or kids from poverty, like coming from areas of poverty, from really poor backgrounds. Um, and they'll, they'll say things like, well, we're, we're not poor. We're really strong in our family and our culture. We might not have much money, but that's, you know, that's not necessarily what we value. So there's a lot of tension, um, and I'm not sure it's one that can be easily resolved. Might be some 
more courageous conversations with some of the funders. But yeah, when it's when funding organisations are set up to bring about social change and impact, how do you show that and how do you sell that? You know, how do you do that in a way that's not exploitative or that reproduces these deficit narratives? When I catch up with Jane and Hayden from Arohanui Strings, it's a few days before their performance at the Michael Fowler Centre with Orchestra Wellington. Give them a performance. Mm. It makes them all pull up their socks <laughs> very fast. Suddenly, whoosh, mm-hmm. they take off. I head to their dress rehearsal and it brings it all back for me. The buzz of being in an orchestra, the cacophony of instruments warming up, the hushed tones as the conductor gives his verdict on your playing. It'll just feel a little bit more, um, I don't know, shiver me timbers a bit. Okay, so let's let's try this now at the super fast tempo, okay? You ready, guys? Okay, don't hurt yourselves. Here we go. And maybe even more so because the conductor is my old conductor from university, Mark Today. Hayden spent a lot of time under his baton too. So we, we both play under him. Yeah. So I was really, really interested to see what he would be like with the kids, but it was more... What I didn't expect was what the kids would be like with him because they all really, really love him. Yeah, and um, he conducted something in one that they expected to be in three, um, and and then like he stopped and everyone was like, "Oh, like, we need you to uh, can you conduct a little more? Like show us the beats." And then he was like, "Oh, I'm just I'm doing in one because otherwise I'll have to do triple the work." And my arms will fly off. And then this one boy was like, "Yeah, fly your arms off, just throw them all over the place." <laughs> While it's not the aim of Sistema to change the face of orchestral music, there's clearly a synergy between these groups and the current desire by professional orchestras to diversify their playing base and audiences. I think there's there's a lot of work to do. The, the pathways are emerging. This is Rod Skip. Um, we're doing as much as we can to kind of support collaborative activities with other partners like the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra, like the New Zealand String Quartet. For advanced Sistema students, there's orchestral internships with APO and Orchestra Wellington, and the NZSO recently held a conducting masterclass for three young Moana Pacific women, including Enya and Anne. All of them were involved with Sistema Aotearoa. So that our young people can see, actually, if I want to develop my, my skills as a musician, where can I go and how do I do that? That's one of my dreams. And Philly Hala would love to see a professional orchestra that's more representative of the demographics of Aotearoa and of her community. And that's why I like working at Sistema, because there are so many of them. Um, I just want to push them in a way where... Because they love classical music, that is so rare. Um, but just to see how much they love classical music, I hope one day it will be them sitting in an orchestra. That would be so amazing to see. In early 2022, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra was conducted for the first time in Australia's history by an Aboriginal person. That conductor, Aaron Wyatt, made the comment that orchestras should feel like home to First Nations people because it's about community and striving towards something together that you could not do individually. And that's what Indigenous existence is. You'll find a handful of young people who have gone through Sistema and Virtuoso Strings doing performance music degrees right now, including Enya. But as she explains, there's still sometimes situations that prevent people from her community taking classical music to a professional level. In, in our area, a lot of our students actually work as well as go to school. Um, myself, I have three jobs and study at university. So <laughs> that's... Um, that's just the way that it is for us. Like a lot of our families, um, even though we want to pursue what we enjoy, which is music, sometimes putting what you enjoy on hold is more ideal than um, watching your family struggle. Mm-hmm. And especially because we're both the oldest of our siblings and that that's a role in itself. If If we have to leave what we love to do, for our family, then there's no question about it. But if there's an opportunity where we can take care of both, 
then that will be like a dream. Both Enya and Viliami are really hoping for careers in music. Definitely want to start producing my own music and um, I, I wouldn't mind teaching music as well. Mm. I've also seen the joys in teaching music through um, my own music teacher at school, Miss Alford. She says, she says like like any job, it's, it has its um, difficulties, but in the end she does have fun. Yeah. Um, what kind of music do you like to produce? Oh, definitely reggae. Mm. That's, that, I mean... Just like any other Polynesian, you know, reggae is like the go-to. Uh, probably will try out hip hop, and um, you know, I've I've never tried composing classical music through a Polynesian perspective, but definitely willing to give that a go as well in the future. Well, I think you know the classical music world needs you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon it just doesn't need me; it needs like more than just me, you know, in your even our other orchestra mates, Eve and Sage, Octavia, everyone, they need everyone. I reckon that movement could start with us. Yeah. yeah. This podcast was presented and produced by Popsock Media for Sounds, Centre for New Zealand Music, Toiti Arapuru, by me, Kirsten Johnstone. Melody Thomas checked my script, and Will Saunders did the mix. Thanks to Creative New Zealand and the Start Trust for funding this podcast. Thanks to Orchestra Wellington and Glenn Downey for use of the piece, Well Within the Maddening Crowd. Incidental music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. The full list of it is on the Sounds website. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to support us in making more, please visit the Sounds website and click on the Donate button at the top of the page. And if you have the means, consider donating to any of the Sistema organisations as well. To hear more of the music of Aotearoa New Zealand, go to the Sounds website, sounds.org, that's S-O-U-N-Z. Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Toi te Sounds.